All right, I'm going to jump in and get started. Um, so hello, everybody. Welcome to GCWS Feminism's Unbound panel, Fashioning Futures. The Consortium for Graduate Studies in Gender, Culture, Women, and Sexuality is a collaboration between nine institutions in the Boston area, BC, BU, Brandeis, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, Simmons, Tufts, and UMass Boston. And we bring together feminist scholars and faculty from across our institutions and more through graduate level courses and then a myriad of events every year. So we're really excited that you came to our first remote event this year. Um, as we come together from wherever you are, we wanna recognize the indigenous and native caretakers of the land that you are from um, or currently occupy. And if you don't know who those peoples are, then you know, we ask that you commit to learning. The GCWS and our member institutions occupy land of Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag people. And we really wanna recognize the repeated violations of sovereignty and territory that's been perpetrated by colonialism and then our own um, actions and inactions of the present day. And land acknowledgements are really not to be taken lightly. They're part of work that um, should be working towards um, responsibility towards land reparations and return um, and honoring indigenous practices that support, nourish, and respect the land and the people. And we want to take 30 seconds to kind of breathe and center ourselves um, before we begin the event. So during the 30 seconds, just ask your body what it needs to be in this space, ask where stress might be, um, and what you can maybe release for the next you know, little bit during our panel. Thank you so much. So as I mentioned before, this is our first Feminisms Unbound panel of this year, and we're really grateful for all of the speakers who are sharing their research and expertise, um, in addition to all of you for being in attendance. Uh, next semester, we're going to have two additional Feminisms Unbound panels planned. We have erotic methods. I, I'm supposed to be able to move this slide down, and of course I can't. Hold on, give me a moment. Maybe. Okay, we'll just talk about it. Um, so next semester, uh, we have erotic methods in February and then returns in April, both also with an excellent lineup of speakers, which you would be able to see if I could flip my slides. Um, and then additionally, next semester, GCWS is offering two courses for master's and PhD level students at our member institutions. There's feminist, queer, and indigenous methods, and then race, sex, and the ethics of collection at the Peabody Museum. Uh, more information on our events can be found on our website. I'm going to put all this information in the chat uh, once we get started. We welcome all of you to engage with each other during the webinar through the chat. Um, please add any questions that you have for our panelists into the Q&A, and we're going to pose those questions to our speakers at the end. And if, you, if it's applicable, please add who the question is to when you put a question in the Q&A. If you want to see the closed captioning, you can just hit the closed captioning button at the bottom of the Zoom. And I'm just going to pass it over to Alora, who's going to introduce all of our amazing speakers. Thank you again so much for joining. Thank you so much, uh, Stacy, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so happy to be here and welcome. A very warm thank you to Stacy Lenz and the Graduate Consortium for hosting this super exciting panel this evening, um, the first of our series this academic year, uh, which I have had the great pleasure of co-organizing with my colleagues, Stacy and Dr. Faith Smith of Brandeis University and Dr. Karim Kupchandani of Tufts University. Uh, my gratitude goes to the team for their always brilliant ideas and insights. When we gathered to plan for this year's panel over the summer months of 2021, 
we found ourselves drawn to the ideas and particularly visual landscapes of resistance, of struggle, creativity, and joy. Uh, given the year that we had been through with COVID-19 raging globally, and of course, we are not out of it, uh, but also all that it had laid bare in such striking ways. So fashioning futures came out of that compelling desire to think deeply about the long legacies of and manifestations of structures of oppression and the ways in which various social groups and individuals make meaning, art, transformative praxis in imagining or fashioning a collective and codependent future. So welcome to Fashioning Futures. This panel starts with the premise that experiences of subjugated peoples have been rooted in a representational apparatus of vicious modernity. Subaltern histories and lives within this apparatus are narrated through the lenses of dispossession, disenfranchisement, and disposability. Feminist and queer cultural production, nevertheless, while conjuring such normative representational aesthetics, simultaneously reimagine suffering, futurity, and human aspirations. Beyond representational revision, correction, or uplift, expressive cultures have the capacity to call into question the very grounds of knowledge that make them possible, and at the same time, hint at new horizons of surviving and thriving. So we invite panelists to think through what are the substantive, symbolic, and structural preoccupations of representational practices across genres that simultaneously trouble our modes of knowledge, yet fashion a more joyful future? In what ways can we conceptualize desires of subjugated peoples to devise and complicate a future beyond a singular traumatic narration? How can art, photography, fashion, and other expressive cultural genres gesture towards an alternate apparatus that is embodied relational and forward thinking, but captures aesthetically and ethically the ruinous present. I will now introduce our distinguished panelists in the order they will speak. Um, we have invited them to make 10 minute remarks following which we will have some time for panelists to interact and ask questions or comment on one another's presentations. And we will then open up the floor or the screen, so to speak, to questions and uh, comments from the audience. Um, I will be brief with the introductions because longer bios will be posted um, in the chat box. So we will begin with uh, Dr. Genevieve Clotario, uh, who is an Andrew W. Mellon Assistant Professor of American Studies at Wellesley College. She specializes in interdisciplinary and transnational feminist approaches to Filipinx and Asian American histories. Her work is especially interested in racial and gendered formations and US empire building in the global south. She's currently completing her first book, Beauty Regimes, um, and this examines the cultural, political, and economic dimensions of fashion and beauty systems that lay at the heart of modern empire and Philippine nation building projects. Then we will hear from Mira Seti, um, who is an interdisciplinary visual artist whose affective research-based practice explores fashion, dress, garments, and materiality from critical feminist and anti-colonial perspectives. She engages drawing, painting, fiber, social practice, and performance to think through migration and its relationship to memory, cloth, and care with a special interest in the histories of South Asia. Mira's award-winning work is in the permanent collection of the Royal Ontario Museum and the Wedge Collection and has been exhibited at the Art Gallery of Ontario, Art Gallery of Mississauga, and the L'Oreal Melbourne Fashion Festival. Then we will hear from Dr. Rachel Afi Quinn, Associate Professor in the Program in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and the Department of Comparative Cultural Studies at the University of Houston. Her transnational feminist cultural studies scholarship focuses on mixed race, gender and sexuality, social media, and visual culture in the African diaspora. Her first book, Being La Dominicana, Race and Identity in the Visual Culture of Santo Domingo, 
was published just this year by University of Illinois Press. Dr. Quinn was part of a filmmaking team that produced the documentary Cimarron Spirit in 2015 about contemporary Afro-Dominican identities. Next, we will hear from Dr. Shoban Carter David, who is an associate professor in the Department of History and affiliate faculty in Women's and Gender Studies at Southern Connecticut State University. She teaches in the areas of cultural studies, women's studies, and African American diaspora and contemporary United States histories. As a public historian, she has worked with museum and special collection curators on projects involving various facets of African American and broad based. United States cultural history. She's the author of various chapters and articles in edited volumes, in exhibition catalogs and academic journals, and is currently completing her book manuscript titled Issuing the Black Wardrobe, Magazines and Fashion Post Soul. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Thea Kirai Tagle, who is a Philippinex femme writer, scholar, teacher and curator whose research broadly investigates socially engaged art and site-specific performance, visual cultures of violence and waste, urban planning and the environment, and grassroots responses to political crises and ecological collapse in the expanded Pacific Rim. Thea is a transdisciplinary feminist scholar and is an assistant professor in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and the program in critical ethnic and community studies, my colleague at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And her research has been published in many academic journals, including American Quarterly, Critical Ethnic Studies, ACME, and um, Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures and the Americas. So I'm so excited now to turn the screen over to our first speaker, Dr. Genevieve Clotario, it's all yours. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Um, uh, thank you for putting this together. And I, I think it's gonna be a really great conversation. I'm actually really excited because um, I, this is all new research for me. And uh, my previous research has nothing to do with joy, quite the opposite. There's like no joy or um, concept of hope in my previous research. So um, to be able to think through this has been, um, to think through this framework has really been really illuminating. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share screen really quick and it's been a while since I did anything on Zoom. So you have to bear with me. I hope this works out. Okay, so, um, okay. So I'm actually gonna talk about this idea of fashion and possibility and joy um, in the context of a, of a history where there seemed like there was no joy, no possibility, no freedom. And it's actually the period of the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines, which lasted from 1965 to 1986. So under this authoritarian regime, which was often described by activists and journalists, uh, journalists of the time as a conjugal dictatorship um, based on the shared power between Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos, um, and during this authoritarian regime, um, beauty actually, beauty and fashion played a critical role. So during this time, it seemed that Imelda Marcos, who we see here on the screen um, to the left of Pierre Balmain, Balmain um, of you know, the um, fashion house, uh, it seemed that she had an iron fist on all things beauty. Her story was one of coming to power. Um, it was narrated as this beauty queen, the Rose of Tacloban, who had, um, because of her beauty, had captured the attention of a World War II hero, uh, Ferdinand Marcos. Uh, an ambitious politician on the rise. So her whole ethos is about like this like power of beauty. And uh, Imelda would continue to frame her power within this framework of beauty, um, you know, with her thousands of shoes. I think that's what she's most famous for. Um, her dresses, her butterfly sleeves, which you can see here on the screen. Um, and she saw herself as a gift to the Filipino people, that her beauty was a gift, something for the increasingly impoverished people from the urban slums of Manila to the rural impoverished farms across the provinces, that these um, the Filipinos could look upon her, um, see her beauty, feel pleasure and secondhand joy, all the while obfuscating that she and Ferdinand Marcos were largely the reasons why there was such impoverishment um, and suffering and oppression in the Philippines. 
Um, she also framed her development projects, which were largely funded by the World Bank and the IMF as beautification projects. Um, she wanted to turn Manila into a, a sort of a, a glamorous third world playground for the global elite, like um, Pierre Balming, who actually hosted a fashion show in 1969. Um, which is after the de declaration of the dictatorship and martial law, uh, he hosted a fashion show in Manila and the guest of honor was Imelda Marcos. Um, but in fact, if we look at the way, if we use beauty and fashion as a lens, we can start to see that Imelda in fact did not totally monopolize fashion and beauty and its alluring power during the years of martial, uh, martial law. And in fact, in the stories generated during martial law and the ways that it's remembered uh, and um, the sort of memories of martial law challenges this idea of the iron butterfly's control over beauty. So sort of thinking beyond um, thinking beyond Imelda in terms of the politicization of beauty, today I'm just going to briefly address here the figure of the beauty queen and also the weaponization of beauty and fashion in anti-martial law movements. Um, okay, in anti-martial law movements. Uh, so, so for example, this is a picture of Maita Gomez, who is, um, she was a model, uh, she won Miss Philippines in 1967, and she's like most famous for sort of giving up her title, giving up her elite status, and joining um, the National People's Army, the sort of radical military sect of, of the Communist Party of the Philippines, which was actually the sort of loudest um, critics, uh, most radical critics of uh, martial law. Um, so Maite Gomez was uh, remembered for and actually very sensationalized in gossip that followed her around to talk about, you know, this sort of transition from a glamorous life to going to the mountains of Bicol province um, to join the army, the National People's Army. Uh, and the stories also, she becomes a sort of like story, sort of mythic story that actually she was able to dodge uh, bullets and bombs because she was so beautiful that beauty became an ar armor against, um, against violence. Um, but she, what she does is she also weapon weaponizes her power and her allure um, as this Miss Philippines, uh, as a fashion model, and uses it to um, to use in terms of political protest against martial law. So, um, and actually Maita Gomez is not the only beauty queen to join these uh, anti-martial law movements. Um, it, there's other beauty queens such as Nelia Sancho, um, Odette Alc Alcantara. Um, and so it, it's actually a thing to be like a beauty queen and also to use your status as a beauty queen to, you know, um, to protest against the Marcos regime. So, um, Looking at Maita Gomez and all of these um, different beauty queens, that we can see that fashion and beauty could also be weaponized as a way to confront and critique the Marcos dictatorship. Oh, so this is a pic picture of Maita Gomez and Nelia Sancho for, for folks so that you can look at, look at them as I tell this story. Okay, so, um, so beauty and fashion would be weaponized as a way to confront and critique the Marcos dictatorship. Um, there are a number of, um, Different units um, that were organized to struggle against uh, la to struggle for land rights, to struggle against the violence and impact on women, um, and so one of the organizations that emerged in these sort of movements was uh, Gabriela, a feminist organization um, that was established in the Philippines, and it's actually a political party now. So. Um, Gabriella would be this sort of umbrella unit for women's rights, women's movements, and feminist action against uh, martial law and also against uh, U.S. imperialism. And one of the sort of sub sort of sub sections of Gabriella was a uh, an organization called Womb, which stood for the Women of the Ouster of Marcos and Boycott. And on March 5th, 1985, Womb organized a fashion show. And they organized the fashion show under the leadership of Maita Gomez. And the fashion show was called State of the Nation Fashion Show. So rather than a State of the Nation presidential address, what they did is they combined politics with this, the repertoire of the fashion show. And they did this in Makati, um, in Makati Greenbelt Square in Manila. So the event borrowed 
from performative acts of anti-martial law protests and rallies. Um, it borrowed also from, as I mentioned, the uh, State of the Nation address, and then combined it with um, a fashion and beauty repertoire. And organizers like Maite Gomez asked their people that they had connections with because you know they were, they were models before, and asked Filipino designers to donate gowns for free. And members of WOM would then model a gown that was transformed into a costume. And each costume would represent an issue that they wanted to critique or bring to light um, in, as a way to critique the Marcos regime. So they would, so each costume would either, you know, would address violations of human rights um, and crimes of the dictatorship. So for example, one model wore a gown painted as the US dollar and she walked the runway with her daughter who was dressed as a, uh, uh, a 20 peso bill. And the bill, and so this was to draw attention to the disparities of the exchange rate um, that was a result of legacies of US imperialism and also the World Bank as sort of just like sort of um, uh, devaluing, you know, devaluing the Philippine peso. Another dress was, uh, was supposed to be a nuclear plant that was representing uh, a plant that the Marcos regime um, uh, established that actually incurred uh, outrageous debt. And then Nelia Sancho, so Nelia Sancho is on the right in this picture. Nelia Sancho's gown comprised of construction materials and was labeled Edifice Complex, an open critique of Imelda Marcos's urbanization and development plans that raised homes of many of the urban poor. And in the case of the Manila Film Center actually led to the deaths of, of 169 workers who were buried alive under the construction of the building. Um, and then the show's finale featured Maita Gomez, who's to the left, um, wearing a white silk gown and a cathedral red cape that declared Dictadurang U.S. Marcos Ibagsak, which translates into the um, down with the U.S. Marcos dictatorship. So beauty queens turned activists played an important role in the mobilization of anti-martial law movements. And, you know, while we can, you know, we shouldn't look at this in sort of a completely romantic point of view, um, and you know, in, you know, we should question what their sort of vision was in terms of independence and democracy, uh, and the relationship with other activists from the working class, the uh, in the urban and rural se um, sectors. Um, we should, we can still think about the possibilities that fashion had animated in terms of a political force in the forms of protest against martial law. And when I was reading this. When I was reading these stories, I was reading it alongside um, the work of Diana Taylor and especially her most recent work um, in the book Presente and thinking about what do you do when there seems like there's nothing that can be done. And in this moment of author authoritarian regime, it really did feel like a time of hopelessness. It seemed like a time where it would be really difficult to rally against uh, against the Marcos regime. And here we can see the repertoire of fashion and beauty as a way to mobilize and give hope and also not just give joy, but to use playfulness and playfulness parody and fashion uh, as a way to think of possibilities, um, as a way to call for the fall of the Marcos regime. So I think, um, you know, this kind of opens up modes of thinking about fashion and resistance in times of seeming hopelessness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Genevieve. Uh, we will go to Mira next. Okay, I think you can hear me now. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you uh, so much for inviting me um, from across the border. And um, I'm really happy to be here and uh, exchange uh, with all of you um, in these uh, sort of common questions that we have. And following, I, I think my presentation following Genevieve's is, uh, it's just, uh, it's worked out really well. So <laughs> there's definitely some common themes. Um, so I just wanted to start off by uh, acknowledging that I'm uh, I'm speaking from Toronto uh, in Canada, and um, Toronto is a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. 
And I uh, came here, I migrated to uh, Toronto at the age of two uh, from New Delhi, India as an immigrant settler. So it's, um, you know, a lot of unlearning and relearning that uh, I continue to do um, being over here on this land. Um, so I'm going to speak about, um, I'm an interdisciplinary visual artist, a contemporary artist, and I want to show you, speak about sort of my most recent work, but to set the tone for that, I'm going to read you a passage from a diary that I've been sharing back and forth with another visual, another contemporary artist who lives in um, Calgary, another part of the country. And um, she's, uh, she is primarily a weaver um, and a painter, and I'm also a, a painter and I work with fiber as well. So we've been doing this um, sort of sharing back and forth by mail, a written, handwritten um, vi uh, diary in which we just, it's a bit free flowing our thoughts about um, what we do and how it connects to our identities and our thoughts. And, because it's quite intimate and personal, I wanted to start with this so I can sort of set the tone for um, some of the more research-based work I've done over the last, uh, over the pandemic. So Wednesday, August 4th, 2021, Toronto. And, and this is me speaking back to her. Her name is Sana uh, Humayun. Receiving your generous thoughts about cloth making and its connection to family, queerness, and personal place is a gift. I'm not sure that I have ever had a conversation like this before, even though the ideas have resided in my body for years. One of the things that struck me about your entry is the assumption of belonging. Why do we assume that cloth belongs to convention and majority ways of life and identity? We have been told about what tradition is and who owns this. But as queer people, our stories have rarely been recorded or honored, so it is easy to assume that our connection to cloth history is marginal. I see that you are questioning the connection between cloth and family and trying to separate these in order to find a place. Is there a space between cloth and the body? Does cloth have its own identity free from the wearer and or the maker? <coughs> and what about cloth that has lived a life? that has been used and mended. That is me. That is how I see myself as cloth. Lots of visible and invisible mending. My Masi, my maternal, grand, uh, my maternal aunt, gave me her most precious shawl, one that she has been using all her adult life. It's a dark fawn color woolen shawl with some intricate precious Kashmiri embroidery on the edges in colors close to the shawl color. When you hold it up to the light, you can see the many places that have been mended in similar color thread. Ruffling is a word I believe my family may use to describe this in Hindi. These mends allow the shawl to continue its life, its use. The shawl becomes queer, unashamed, special, cared for, unique, enduring, and a closer reflection of me. Uh, so I, I started with that um, because I wanted to um, sort of share a little bit how I've been, uh, how my most recent work has shifted sort of for me, the conversation of identity from a worn sense of identity from strictly a representational uh, perspective, which is uh, the way uh, um, a lot of my paintings um, have functioned, uh, filling in gaps of representation around queerness, around um, older bodies, around women of color. Um, and thinking about those, what, working with those and, and, and starting to look deeper into cloth and, and the worn body and, and where does that cloth come from and sort of thinking about the materiality of cloth, I started thinking a lot about care. So, you know, um, that representational practice is also a practice of care, um, is starting from care of self and then thinking about care of others in the communities that I belong to. But then I also started thinking about care sort of deeper and more broadly. So, um, you know, um, in, in doing that, I so I went from sort of a self care to thinking about um, a care of cloth, care of those who make the cloth, care of um, the ecosystem in which cloth exists. And I wanted to slow down this sort of entire system to try and understand it and try and understand my relationship um, of being, you know, in um, 
in the global north, in the first world, in um, as a consumer of clothing, not a maker of clothing, as someone who's sort of fighting for identity and representation and belonging, it, sort of thinking about my relationship to people and um, women of color as well, who maybe, um, you know, share a racial identity perhaps with me, but, but, but then everything else is completely different and think about where the cloth that I wear that I use to express myself comes from and how it's made. And so, and how we care for it. And so in doing that, I um, did a three-part project called Unskilled. And um, the I'm gonna just share the uh, share my screen. So while I'm talking, uh, I only have a few minutes left, but while I'm talking, you can have a look at some of these images. So, uh, okay. Um, okay, so you can see here that, um, Here's two images on uh, your right is a drawing that I've made and on your left is a, a media image of um, uh, women outside of a textile factory in Bangladesh protesting for um, their rights to um, a, a proper livelihood. And in Unskilled, I worked with thinking about the um, sort of the racialized gender labor of the garment worker, um, mostly in South Asia, looking at images from Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. And um, wanted to, you know, I, it was during the pandemic. I was I was stuck in, you know, where I where I am. Um, I had actually previously uh, visited Bangladesh just before the pandemic, and I had gone to the um, the the grave site where the um, unmarked hundreds of unmarked graves of the women who perished in the Rana textile factory collapse and and another factory fire were were buried um, which was a very emotional experience and I came back and the pandemic hit and I wanted to think about that in a way that um, involved my sort of art making process and so what I did was I looked at hundreds of media images um, attached to articles about um, you know what had happened over there and and I and I and I started to use drawing as a method to look closer and to look closer not at what was manufactured but look closer by looking closer at what was worn by the garment workers themselves during acts of protest um, and, 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 and to slow down this understanding and start to look closer at these images, you know, we often gloss over. So I produced a series of drawings that each of them zeroed in on one aspect of a protesting worker um, through the media images that I could glean um, online. Uh, and, uh, and then the other, there were two other parts of the project. Um, and I guess, we're, you know, we can talk about these more in, just in, in conversation, but uh, the next one was a, um, I created a, oh, you know what, you can't see this because you're seeing my screen, so just one minute. Um, I created a, uh, a label for, um, in which I created over 40 symbols um, that each speak to different aspects of clothing production, our care, uh, that we bring, so the heart symbols are the, uh, our emotional connection attachment to uh, the clothing we own, the uh, sewing machine symbols are about the labor of making the clothing. The plant symbols are about the uh, environmental ecosystem of the clothing. And the building symbols are about the workplaces or the factories in which clothing is made. And I made this, it's a cotton label, 100% cotton label, um, along with a um, an index card. And I've been mailing these out for free to anybody who asks over the pandemic so that people can then um, sew this onto a garment and um, extend the, um, the, the common uh, care labels that we see on garments, how to wash, iron, fold, um, and uh, dr uh, dry the garment, um, only are, are only about the garment itself, not about the ecosystem. So I wanted to extend that conversation by creating my own label that um, I'm hoping to uh, put into um, copy free, some, some sort of copy free uh, situation where people can freely use those new symbols. And then I have just, uh, I'm just about over time, but I just wanna show you one more image about the third part of my project, which was, um, I grew a cotton plant in Toronto, very cold over here. Um, oh, how do I, hold on a minute. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Yeah, here you can get a better view. I drew. I, I grew a cotton plant from um, seed. Uh, it's an organic cotton seed all the way to a, about a uh, six feet tall plant that gave me two balls of two tiny, tiny balls of cotton. And I wanted to do this because I wanted to slow down the cycle of fiber development so I could understand and see the magic of cotton being produced. Of course, cotton has this huge, um, you know, global history that um, brought in uh, or, or brought together these, you know, huge uh, oppressive systems of slavery, indenture, um, colonization. Um, and so it sort of really just wraps around the world, but I wanted to slow that down and, and grow that myself. So I'm going to stop there um, and hopefully we'll get into some of these things in conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, we'll go to Rachel next. Hello, everyone. I am really thrilled to be in this conversation among you. Um, greetings from Houston, Texas, where I'm on the unceded land of the Sana, the Konkawa, Atak, Ishak peoples, and the Kohitekan. And um, <clears throat> I, I want to share a few slides of images to talk with you about my work, where it's been, uh, what's inspired it, and um, perhaps a little bit of where I'm heading. And I agreed that these questions have been so nicely provocative um, to push us forward. So let's see if you can just see the object that now exists in the world that is my transnational feminist ethnographic book. Um, that is where I've been for many years. Uh, I spent time in the Dominican Republic uh, talking with Dominican women about their experiences of race and identity and um, figuring out and wrestling with ways to tell a story that was not my own, but with overlapping experiences of mixed race and um, starting to theorize a bodily experience of racial ambiguity. And the way that I did that with um, an American studies degree and a cultural studies um, project was by using a lot of visual culture um, and being hyper aware of the ways that Dominican women were using visual culture in that context for self-expression, identity construction, and resistance. Uh, in, for, on, with this particular book um, from University of Illinois Press, I had the opportunity to highlight the work of um, an artist friend of mine who um, is, sorry, got a little nervous. Uh, my friend Lucia Mendez Rivas and her work on the the art for the cover um, captures some of the for me when I look at this image some of the ways that Dominican women are wrestling with blackness and their alignment with association with blackness and then also their claims on uh, black identity and actually with this project I'll talk a little bit about the roots of it but what I found and sort of ended up in the book, I, I thought I would talk more with Afro-Dominican women and how they identified, but um, and in ways I did, but I always was having to learn the visual context of that place. And I felt that, um, you know, I the work of that kind of engagement required that I reevaluate what I had learned about race and mixed race. And I looked to um, Dominican feminist activists in particular uh, around learning what what the challenges are and issues are at the intersections of race and gender in that context in a very mixed space, thinking about, you know, this idea um, that we've had since I was in school, let's see, around you know, the future might be racially mixed and what does that mean? And so the images I have here are this, from 1993, this kind of composite identity of mixed race um, that we were often engaged in. in. The field of critical mixed race studies, we were often talking about, you know, this idea of the, the future would be racially mixed and how would we navigate that? And so my, my research question sort of led me to think more globally around communities that are always already and have for a very long time been quite mixed race and um, also in this slide on the right hand side what I have is an image from a project of where I started of my graduate studies was thinking about the moment that I was in undergrad in the late 90s and this conversation amongst 
quite pr relatively privileged uh, mixed race young people in um, private liberal arts colleges and where we fit in the context around um, diversifying communities, but also wrestling with our own relationships to um, whiteness and predominantly white institutions. And this image um, is actually an advertisement uh, from about MAVEN, an organization that one of the young people at Wesleyan University where I studied was um, developing as a project of families and led by um, mixed race young people and then also producing a magazine. And so that magazine and the eight issues that emerged, um, I held on to over the years as I wrestled with what the significance was of a mixed race moment and why in the US we were wrestling with and celebrating that identity. And the magazine, the visual culture really captured a lot of the ways of that moment of kind of exotifying mixed race bodies that when you look to Latin America, you can see a long trajectory of that um, the sort of uh, celebration under kind of a neoliberal moment, what is marketable. And the studying and uh, thinking through the significance of this magazine helped me to think about the challenges of trying to articulate in new ways uh, how race is functioning when so often like the images can get co-opted and they become something that uh, then gets used to kind of sell an idea. And so in this case, it was a move from the kind of the political action of creating an inclusive census that might better represent people of mixed race heritage. Um, but then also you could see over the time of the production of the magazine and who was involved, that certain voices with more um, cultural currency and power had more influence on how the identity of mixed race got constructed. And so we're now in a moment where we have a critical mixed race studies as a more academic field, but um, there's still a lot to build on that conversation, which has surprised me over the decades. So I took that impetus for asking questions about mixed race and why it exists the way it does in the US abroad to think comparatively. Um, and what I found was also, you know, mixed race people of African descent, young Dominican women uh, wrestling with their own representations. And so I, I am really interested in um, the ways that folks have used the internet, social media to produce and represent themselves. I think in some of the ways that you all have been talking about the existing critiques on on the left, you see a, a social, it's an Instagram image by Penelope um, Collado. And in that image, which I use in my book, there's so many layers to the way that she's critiquing the context that she is in in the Caribbean and the stereotypes that we have and the visual messages we already bring to, um, to reading that context. And this image challenges that. And so the work shows the way that Dominican women are you know, well aware in that context and can offer their own critiques as they do in the interviews that I do with them. On the right side, you have the whole cast captured by um, the person in the middle, actress Cindy Galan, uh, the whole cast of the play La Casa de Bernarda Alba. My first book covers a lot of different visual cultural productions in the Dominican Republic, specifically Santo Domingo. But um, I, I, I dedicated a chapter to what happens if you put racially mixed bodies into that you know, well-known Spanish play and how we might read it differently. But what I really loved was the opportunity to also, well, in the context of Santo Domingo and 2010, um, you know, every folks were really engaged on Facebook. And um, I loved being able to kind of connect with communities, organizing um, communities, young Dominican women who wanted to have these conversations with me about race and color, and then also be able to track that on a, a growing archive that is Facebook. And um, I know people have different relationships with Facebook now um, and Instagram as well, but it was really nice to be able to include the selfie and, uh, in this published work. And I think that, you know, there's so much more that we could talk about of how the selfie works in terms of self-production and identity. But what I was finding was that to talk about mixed race in this context, it was very necessary to always use the visual. And so the way that I incited conversation was to um, bring images of different, actually different celebrities to talk from the image about 
what the stereotype of the Dominican woman was, and people were always talking relationally. So they would say to me, well, this person is darker than you or lighter than me, but those ideas about color are held inside their head and, and they shift a lot in context and relationally. So um, I've been thinking about that and I also, like Genevieve was saying, the challenge of you know moving to the joy piece of the work. I mean, my work ends up you know having to face the violence against women and the Dominican Republic, the devaluation of their bodies, and you know definitely how that relates to a hierarchy of color and the way you know blackness is seen and engaged. Um, but I also you can see I think in these images also the joy of self production and the construction of self. And um, I'm interested to see how many folks in academia are interested in taking up social media archives as they exist um, because it is very scary and unwieldy and you know shifts over time so these are older images and the internet um, and these platforms keep changing um, but then you know going forward I have many different projects and have benefited a lot from the work done in digital humanities to think about these archives and the politics and power dynamics of the self-produced archives and larger projects. And I have been um, thinking about more recently um, black art in the context of the museum. And I had the opportunity to see this um, work by Njeka um, Akili Crosby, a Nigerian artist. The, um, this unframed work is at the LACMA now with all of the portraits, the black portraits at the, um, with the Obama portraits. So that recently opened, but what you may not be able to tell from this image, I think speaks to some of the conversation we're gonna get into are the ways that um, she's used archival images to build out like all the right side of that text. And those are predominantly images of African leadership. And um, I think in the purple even, you can see uh, at the very bottom under the chair, it's like an image um, of Chimamanda Adichie, and you can see um, this sort of layering and um, painting. And so in her work, she's known for doing that. And I think, you know, we're relying on artists to build these archives, and I'm very fascinated with artists that are drawing on uh, broader visual archives, but what I saw at that exhibit and, you know, I actually am a Ghanaian American, so I have one parent that's Jewish and one parent that is Ghanaian. And so like seeing the way that the African diaspora returns into conversation with um, African Americans is, of many generations has really been an interest for me and figuring out where these archives might overlap. So this comparative analysis and what it helps us see about constructions of race. And in this image, not only that like archival history that emerges for me, I'm also reading kind of the just the power dynamics of the bodies in the room. So I'll leave it there. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was fabulous. Um, we will go to Shoban. I was muted, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna be talking while I'm showing you some images. So again, I'm Siobhan Carter-David and I'd like to talk about the starting point of this particular research as being based in a conversation I had with a friend who's uh, about 40 years my senior, uh, back in 2008. Um, and she's a black woman. And she told me, as we were looking through some photos of her when she was in college, she said, one thing I love about your generation is that you don't give a damn what white people think about you. Um, and because we were talking about dress and attire. And I said, well, is that true? I don't know. And so it took me down this path of trying to um, to changing my dissertation topic, first of all. <laughs> and then um, this path of trying to figure out, well, have we cared? What does racial uplift mean for Black folks and how does it tie into um, a fashion and dress post-civil rights? Presuming that, you know, and of course we think about different times in history where people were very hopeful. And I can imagine that there was a moment, although the, the scholarship tells us otherwise in some ways, that African-Americans did feel hopeful about change 
uh, at the height of the civil rights movement and all the civil rights legislation that was being passed in the mid 1960s. So my thought was, if I look at magazines beginning in 1968, um, I, at, at the height of the soul aesthetic, and if I end in around 1993, 94 with the founding of Vibe Magazine, this is a crucial time when magazines still had a huge impact on Black Americans and galvanizing us in a way that um, newspapers could not, uh, because a lot of them were locally distributed, although we do have some of those nationally distributed magazine uh, newspapers. Um, and then also figuring, and before hip hop becomes an international phenomenon. So I'm looking at really the, 60, the 70s and 80s. Um, my fashion, my research on fashion has taken me a few different places really quickly. Um, and so um, I've done work on looking at the aesthetic of women in the 5% nation, also known as the nation of gods and earths, because I have some overlap in um, black nationalism as an interest. Um, I've published on black print culture um, and also published on African-American women and travel and how travel's engaged with the intersection of race, gender, second wave feminism and class in the 1970s. Um, but this particular project I'm talking about with you now is um, the book that has not been published yet, <laughs> but that will be shortly. Um, and the initial uh, research looked at eight widely distributed African-American fashion and lifestyle magazines um, and, and four newspapers that represented uh, uh, the North, South, East and West of the United States. Um, as the project has grown and will uh, be uh, has manifested itself into my book, it now encompasses about five dozen magazines. So it's been a lot of work collecting and cataloging and going to archives over the course of the last eight years or so. But what I wanna to talk to you about today is just what my research has uncovered. And so again, it's this question of, you know, what does racial uplift mean in terms of dress? Um, and the way that, of course, I entered into this research thinking to myself, well, and, and, and found this to be generally the case, that different magazines are, have different missions and that they're catering to particular uh, aspects of the African-American community in a time when the uh, Black community is becoming much more diversified and stratified in terms of class, uh, particularly by the time we're entering into the 1980s. And so we have some uh, publications that are relatively radical, um, those that are very, very clear about their assimilationist politics. And a lot of them are, are in between. It depends on the conversation that's being had. And so uh, some of the magazines I looked at in my initial research were Essence Magazine. Um, this is the very first issue that was published, by the way. It's the only magazine that I cover in all five dozen that's still publishing to this day. <laughs> they all are defunct. Some of them were only around for a few couple of years. Um, some of them are regional, some are just uh, catering to men, some to women. There's even uh, a couple that were just for youth. Some of them are completely fashion and beauty magazines. Some of them are lifestyle magazines. So there's a mix here. We have Modern Black Men, which was a magazine that ran in the early 80s. Um, uh, and you see Miles Davis here on the cover. Class Magazine uh, became later known as the African Diaspora, but that stood for Caribbean, Latin American Sights and Sounds and then another magazine called Black Elegant. So these are just the ones I wanted to show you, but again, there's, there's so, so many. Um, and of course I chose covers, not in the case of Class Magazine, because even though they did have um, fashion politics engaged, and I'll talk about that in a minute, they didn't have it on any of their covers. So I just wanted to show you a few covers here. And so, so really in my work, what I've found is that uh, there are five different ways in general that, um, magazines were using fashion instruction as a form of racial uplift. And this is done in a range of ways, right? It's happening with magazine covers, editorials, fashion spreads, responses to letters to the editor, advertisements. I mean, there's so many ways to look at this. Um, but there are three gen five general ways that I've seen this happening. And I've been uncovering, again, this in all of these magazines I've had to pull out of the archive. And I really begin with looking at the Black body because although so much of what is being engaged is about clothing, it begins with this notion that there is some kind of phenotypical difference in the black body, different uh, in the African body, different than the European body. And of course, there's no medical evidence that's the case. Although many people have argued that it matters only because um, there's a cultural difference perhaps in the ways that people of African descent have tended to uh, appreciate the black body in the modern world. Um, and I think a, a, 
Professor Sabrina Springs did a really good job in her book, um, uh, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, where she's talking about the shifts that happen in this context around seeing the Black body as, as um, too thin and emaciated and unhealthy at one point, and then later gross and voluptuous, right? And so what happens is these magazines begin to, at least some of them, and Essence does after a lot of um, problematic engagement between readers and the editor in the early 1970s, begins to embrace the Black woman's body. And, and my work is dealing also with hair, right? How are we manipulating our hair to look different um, and to accommodate the, the, the professions we hope to have and to, to, um, to do well in and to present ourselves well. Um, and also the body, right? This notion that there's, um, again, this, uh, what is it called? The African physique. I think that was the term that was used in the magazine Ebony Man, which also stopped publishing in the 19, early 1990s, I think. It was part of the Johnson's uh, publication empire. Um, and so what's very interesting about looking at the Black body in these magazines is how um, hypocritical it can be. On one hand, I think Essence to this very day has fashion spreads for um, the woman size, size four, size eight, size 12 and goes all the way up to size 20 something, right? And at the same time, we see a slew of ads for um, weight loss um, in these magazines, all these uh, uh, various instruction on how to uh, change your body through exercise so that you can be slim, slim and, and sort of have that kind of representation. Now, but, but most of what I find in these magazines has less to do with the body and just more to do with how we're showing up in the world. And so another way that these magazines are using fashion instruction as a form of racial uplift, and again, really quickly, as I go back to talk about the body, you know, racial uplift here could mean celebrate your African physique or show up thin and slim in your clothing in order to represent the best of yourself. And this is the tensions we're gonna see in every aspect of how uh, fashion is addressed in these magazines. And so there's a lot on women in dress and men in dress for work, of course. Um, and so I just have two images here from Essence Magazine, uh, Suits Mean Business. Uh, one of the ways that magazines sought to instruct uh, the readership was to um, profile uh, women or men who were, you know, at the height of their careers. You know, this is the late 70s, early 80s. And so we have corporate culture and a lot of discourse happening around corporate attire and the power suit. And so um, Black women and men are engaging this as well. But then we also have people who are taking this and put it, flipping it on his head by um, incorporating uh, Afrocentric prints into this attire. And this is, of course, in 1988 when we're seeing another uptick um, in Afrocentric fashion. First, we see this in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and then we again see an emergence of this in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, Another way that we see having this, this show up, and I have an article, I've, a book chapter I published um, some years back in a book called Race and Retail, where we talk, I talked about Black glamour and how this is one way as well that African-American magazines are trying to use racial uplift as a, as a um, uh, using fashion as a form of racial uplift by looking, um, by instructing African-Americans who the magazine presumes are new uh, to having disposable income, are new to being able to um, engage with um, the upper class in ways that they hadn't before, instructing them on how to show up. So here's, and some of it seemed a little bit uh, patronizing to me. And of course, that's the juicy stuff that's in the research that I kind of pull out, right, in my writing. Uh, this is um, a piece from a Modern Black Men, Formal Eloquence, um, how to show up to a black tie event. But then you also have some ads. I have an ad here out of Class Magazine, again, later known as African Diaspora Magazine, which is showing you how to show off your heritage in formal wear. So you see kente cloth, um, cummerbunds, and, um, and bow ties, and that sort of thing. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll keep moving forward. Uh, we see here, my, uh, Ebony Man also does the same with you know, showing these patent leather shoes and crock and bog leather and a, a little pipe here, but kente cloth bow tie to go along with this formal eloquence. Um, one of the things I love the most is the way that cultural dress shows up in the sacred and secular. And so there was a time in the height of this Afrocentric moment in which we see um, black college queens are dressed in Afrocentric attire. So here you see Miss Collegiate African-American in November, 1991. And then we see in 1992 and 1993, the black college queens similarly attire in um, Kente Claw, which of course is a connection to um, Ghana, as you mentioned, Rachel. I'd love to talk more about that. 
Um, and of course, we can talk more about the special relationship that African Americans have with, uh, with Ghana. Um, but not only that, we can see mud cloth and we see other types of um, Ankara prints as well. Uh, and even casual fashions here. So Upscale Magazine here, it was selling uh, kente cloth um, in the form of like bomber jackets and little strips of cloth on, um, you know, informal clothing and even Kwanzaa, right? And so here we see it move into, it's still, it's still secular, but it moves into um, more holiday, holiday fashions. I have a, a, a section um, that I love um, and I can't wait to get feedback on it once this book is finally published on uh, the African-American wedding and the role that um, Uplift plays in uh, attaching itself to, to Africa as a point of reference uh, for nuptials. And so I noticed that in the early 70s, it's really rigidly attached to trying to copy uh, um, uh, wedding rituals from different parts of Africa. And as we move on into the 80s and 90s, it becomes more about an amalgamation of African-American and African tradition. So people jumping the broom, but still wearing African-inspired fashions. Um, and here's just a few to look at. Very fascinating. Egyptian style, they call it. Here's more on jumping the broom and uh, um, uh, African-inspired um, wedding rings. Some of them I think may have been carved um, using um, Adinkra symbols from Ghana. Um, and here's a couple more. And then and, and finally, um, I end the book purposefully in this way. I'm looking at the ways in which magazines were not addressing the emergent hip hop culture um, in, this, in, the, in the 80s in particular, and the ways that a lot of the fashion that we look at today as being early hip hop fashion was attached to gang membership and problematic fashions, where on the left here, most of these magazines throughout the 70s and 80s looked at youth fashion as being attached to campus culture. And so ch children and young adults who are on campus dress in ways that are respectable. It's the 80s, so it's a lot of prep. Um, and this can be a, this is from the same issue of Essence Magazine, which I thought was very, very striking. Um, and so I'll end here. Um, this issue of racial uplift is something I've been working on for quite a while, and I'm looking forward in, to finish incorporating the remaining 50 something magazines um, into the narrative of my book. So thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. Wow, what an amazing archive. Um, we're going to move to our final speaker, uh, Thea. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me tonight. It's amazing to have heard all of these presentations and I hope that whatever I contribute can just help forward this conversation, which I think it's gonna be fantastic. Um, so as uh, Laura said, my name is Thea Kirai Tagle and I'm calling in tonight from Providence, Rhode Island, the traditional territories of the Narragansett and Wampanoag people. And tonight I'm gonna to talk a bit about two curatorial projects that I began in 2018, um, which were mounted and exhibited in Seattle, uh, Washington on Duwamish land and in San Francisco, California, um, uh, Ramotush uh, Ohlone. Land. So I'm going to start sharing screen. So the question that I ask in all of my research is this, and it's what worlds are we purposefully and inadvertently creating through our curation, our writing, our teaching, and all our practices of being in relation? And how can visual art, both making it and curating it, help us fashion otherwise possibilities for more just worlds? And so um, the two shows that I'm talking about tonight, um, which I began curating in 2018, Afterlife, What Remains, and Afterlife, We Survive, really grew out of these research questions and also in particular um, research that I've done that's been cited in the Philippines and other places across the Pacific, um, places such as San Francisco's Bayview District, Hawaii's Big Islands, and Southern California's Salton Sea, or places where the state and corporations have wastelanded, and that's borrowing from Tracy Brent Boyles, um, entire populations, lands, and seeds, um, and where you know we've seen some of the fiercest uh, resistance to militarism, settler colonialism, and capitalist extractivism. And so for me, you know, thinking about these different sites of violence and also different joyful modes of resistance and resilience, um, the hope that I had in mounting these two group exhibitions of afterlife was, you know, to platform artists, especially queer and trans artists of color, whose work I think helps us clearly look at places that have been so devastated by violence, 
um, as you know, sites of possibility, radical possibility and new world making, right? And my hope for platforming these artists and creating different venues for showing and talking about their work too, was that these wouldn't be one time only visual art events, but actually, right, could be ongoing um, sites of conversation or sites of inspiration that could help continue, right? Um, uh, forwarding, right, ongoing mobilizations for place and space and sovereignty, right, that people are doing in their home communities. So I'm just going to show a few images of some of these shows and talk a little bit about, really briefly, a few of these artists and I'm going to answer questions about other artists or other artworks that you see in, in Q&A and in our conversation. Um, so the first show is Afterlife What Remains, which uh, was mounted at the Alice Gallery in 2018. And so the Alice was an independent artist run space in Seattle um, in the Georgetown neighborhood that was run by myself and six other feminine queer collaborators, many of us of color. We were um, pretty much entirely self-funded and collectively we mounted contemporary art exhibitions monthly until um, we shut the operation down in 2019. So Afterlife Remains, which I'm kind of scrolling through installation images here, featured work by Filipino, Asian diasporic and Native American artists, Alejandro Acierto, Michael Arcega, Leroy Nu, Rhea Tajiri and Super Futures Haunt Collective. And the show in general um, was, and this is quoting from you know, my own writing about it, it was a multi-genre visual art and performance exhibition that stages a conversation between Asian Pacific American and indigenous artists around the questions of what are new strategies that, um, what are new strategies we need to survive after environmental collapse and military intervention by communities facing displacement and dispossession of different kinds and how can speculation, humor and fantasy fuel larger movements for social change around the Pacific. So from the Pacific Northwest to California to Southeast and uh, Southeast and East Asia and in the heartland of the US. Um, and so, you know, for me and bringing these five artists together and we're seeing some uh, documentation of um, uh, the opening night activation or visitation by Super Futures Punk Collective here. Um, for me, I really wanted to uh, platform these artists for the ways that they illuminate hidden histories of dispossession and present day realities of living amongst climate collapse and other forms of state violence, um, but also don't necessarily provide one solution, right? They're thinking about different speculative ways, especially around um, living in right relation, right? To others and to the environment um, that we can all you know, learn from. And so one of the artists um, featured in this show was Leroy New and his Aliens of Manila series, which I found on Instagram and which is still viral Instagram, um, this series of photographs and my performances features a ragtag group of aliens whose exoskeletons have been fashioned from plastic goods, ranging from chinelas or plastic slippers to colanders to fly swatters. And you can kind of make out what things are in these, in these images. Um, all of these uh, goods, of course, are the excesses of Chinese American and Philippine plastic capitalism. And by using them, New brings levity to otherwise dire spaces like the Pasig River that goes through Manila, which is a river that was once so polluted it was considered a dead river, right? But which has finally become better able to support life um, because of the work of indigenous and urban poor communities and activists, including Leroy New himself. Um, and you know, for me, Aliens in Manila moves beyond the mandate to reduce, reuse, and recycle to really help us consider how Filipino people in the diaspora and at home must learn to adapt to realities in which plastic pervades everything, right? Land, skin, sea, our own bodies. Um, and so briefly, Afterlife We Survive, which is a much expanded exhibition um, that featured uh, host, a, a much expanded list of artists and a larger kind of scope of, of work. Um, this exhibition opened at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in fall 2020. This is the exterior of Yerba Buena. Um, and it expanded the range and scope of the exhibition to ask how can new media, visual art and performance help us imagine new ways of surviving and thriving in places ravaged by environmental collapse policing and surveillance, health disparities and loss of homes and land. And how can creative proposals for more just and livable futures support and amplify the grassroots organizing led by LGBTQ, indigenous, Latinx, black, Asian and Pacific Islander communities in the Bay and beyond. 
And you know, my dissertation research was cited on the housing crisis and artist responses to the housing crisis in the Bay Area. And so being able to bring this show and really think through the ongoing place-based movements is really important um, to me in, in, in doing this here. So as you all know, March, 2020, oh, sorry, 17 artists, 10 of them, um, six of them uh, solo artists for collaborative endeavors. So 17 artists total were featured in the show. Um, with COVID uh, closures in March, 2020, and then wildfires up and down the Pacific West Coast, the entire show had to be converted from an indoor presentation that was supposed to be on 3,000 square foot of indoor gallery space to a fully um, public exhibition that was viewable from the outside of the Ibuana Center buildings, as well as a full online portal that had a 3D virtual walkthrough, online only artworks, conversation artists, and virtual exhibitions. Um, and also given the institutional timeline that they gave us, uh, we had to make this conversion in six weeks. Um, and so what I'm gonna just briefly kind of end with and think about is, you know, for me in creating this the show went to foreground and, and bring forth artists whose lessons of radical care and stewardship right could help us imagine new futures and what this experience of working under extreme duress all of us myself the artists the three YBC staff we worked with really um, forced was you know how do we actually put and mobilize these acts of radical care into practice right to actually put up the show how do we support and hold each other and you know work in mutual aid right, to, to do this when some of our lives quite actually were in danger, right? Artist Misha Cardness, whose uh, images we saw in the flyers for this event, you know, whose video games and soul deals with climate collapse because of wildfires, herself had to evacuate again um, in Santa Cruz when the wildfires were right there on the campus, right, and elsewhere. So lessons of radical care in many of the artworks were foregrounded. Um, and in these works, Black and Indigenous femme labor Right, is shown to carry us through generations. Morris, uh, Courtney Desiree Morris's Soul Nostalgia series photographically documented the intergenerational history of Black women's survival in Mossville, a Freeman's town in Louisiana that's still being destroyed not only by climate emergencies, but also by South African and other multinational petrochemical companies. A larger than life portrait of Morris's grandmother, Mrs. Freeman, dwelt alongside the artist wearing a gas mask, a symbol of black breath being stolen due to environmental racism and intersecting racial and sexual violence against black women. Just down the walkway, 11 monumental portraits from Art 25's Future Ancestors series model forms of queer relation in excess of heteronormatively sanctioned ties. Accompanied by poetry recited asynchronously by the, collect uh, the collective, Future Ancestors asserts the sovereignty of Black and Indigenous women to possess and share their own self-image as their artwork is never for sale. And so while Collect Them and Queer Upliftment was represented visually in the show, it was also represented material, experienced and embodied materially in the ways that all of us co-labored to open this exhibition in the absence of appropriate or adequate institutional support. And this experience demands that I truly shift my curatorial approaches to develop better skills and to practice what I'm now terming relational curation. And so challenging the ways that art institutions only value artists for their productivity, I think about and try to practice relational curation as a long-term labor in which artists and curators work horizontally towards shared benefits, even when artists or curators cannot be as productive as capitalism expects them to be. And so by supporting artists, even or especially when it's structurally impossible to do so, um, I'm interested in how we as curators can work in solidarity and alliance with artists towards material benefits and long time community resurgence that extends far beyond moments of emergency and longer than the duration of one art exhibition. And so for me, you know, the biggest lesson of curating afterlife is really to think about what being in right relationship really means. Right, and what you know, supporting work and mounting work that imagines different futures can really look like in the everyday practice, right, of being in right relation um, with one another. And so I'll end with thinking about you know, K. Uh, K. Wayne Yang and Eve Tuck in their article, "Decolonization is not a metaphor." Right, they remind us that survivance, like decolonization, isn't a metaphor, but is actualized through material acts. 
And so for me, you know, I'm really still trying to think through what does it mean as a curator, especially one invested in the politics of anti-gentrification work, to use platforms like this to push back against institutions like Yerba Buena, which has a history of having displaced over 3,000 Filipino families to create this building, right? How to actually push them to move beyond representation and inclusion to really giving up sonic space and visual space um, for projects that, that organize and demand, right? Repatriation and right relationship and land. So yeah, with that, I will end and I look forward to our conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for those really uh, thought-provoking and rich um, presentations and also all of the visual images that we saw so um, powerful and you know really on my mind. Uh, we have some time now for uh, panelists to ask questions and comment on one another's uh, research and presentation and thinking and um, I was thinking that I would just start us off by obviously there were so many um, shared uh, themes that came up in many of the presentations. Uh, so the ways in which that you're using the idea of um, fashion and creativity. So Genevieve, for instance, you know, when you talk about the dual uses of fashion, right, that it can at the one hand simply by create the creation of this persona and image that Imelda Marcos did of beauty and fashion that how it also served to mask uh, the suffering that was unleashed by this regime but at the same time that how artists and activists were also able to use their uh, status as beauty queens and fashion to really confront and um, resist some of that um, state uh, violence in a way. And I really found um, that connected with uh, Rachel, what you were talking about too, in terms of um, how uh, mixed race identity um, among uh, women in the Dominican Republic can get co-opted in uh, fashion magazines transnationally, but there is also this opportunity um, for women to self-create um, a certain persona and identity and you know I loved the what you said about the selfie and how you know that can further be edited or not and to create um, a certain persona so uh, would love to hear more uh, from the two of you about that and I was also really struck by what you said um, Mira about in, in your work about the labor of fashion so turning away from the object of consumption and, and production to um, the, uh, and, and turning towards the body, right? The bodies that produce these um, objects. But also when we look at the terrible um, violences that have occurred in, in the uh, Rana Plaza and uh, Tazreen factory that you talked about, literally the, the bodies have been disappeared in, in a way, right? So there are these mass graves and um, people, our family members are still searching for uh, remains. And, um, and you know, it also made me uh, think about what you were talking about, Shoban, when you talked about um, how you study dressing um, in, in this, you know, sort of decades of ar ar the archive that you shared with us from your study that you went through decades of fashion magazines and, and how the dressing you're looking at dressing as a form of racial uplift, but it also is a, it, it tells us, it illuminates something about uh, the black body, that what kinds of messages are being put forward for the black body. So the, the way that both of you have talked about the body is also something that I'm thinking ab about and wanting to hear more um, about. And, and, and Thea, I was really struck um, by your use of um, resilience um, and it, it's something, you know, I, I think it came up specifically in your presentation and how um, artists and activists are using these various forms of, um, or various materials um, to think about what kinds of uh, futures we are creating and fashioning and, and, and how um, does re resilience fit into that. And I was just uh, reminded, I mean, recently I was in conversation with um, 
um, a feminist geographer, and, and she was talking about this term resilience in relation to vulnerable communities and how it's often used um, by say development programs, modernization programs as a way to abandon um, vulnerable communities, right? So because the idea is that, oh, well, they are resilient so they can take care of themselves. But I think in your work, you're using it in a very different way, of course. And um, if you would you know, um, say, uh, more about that. So uh, these are just some ideas and questions that came up for me as I was uh, listening to all of these amazing uh, presentations. Um, and I'm sure you all have questions and comments of one another. Um, so why don't we take a few minutes to get into that. And I invite audience members to uh, post questions as um, we get into the conversation. So yes, if um, anyone wants to start off. I, I can start off sure. um, because it became clear to me just as you were talking about the connections between our work um, that I'm, I'm a historian. And so, so much of what um, I'm, I study has happened and things have changed a lot. So magazines don't have the same uh, impact they once had because we have social media. But then I think about how all of our work deals with bodies and how this country has been very slow to remedy the problem of anti-Blackness. Um, and when you were asking me about the body, questions about the body, it makes me think about the fact that there are still the need for laws to be passed to allow Black folks to show up with their hair natural in ways that um, are, are best for the care of, of, of Afro-textured hair. Um, I do not know too much about the legislation, but I know the Crown Act um, has been, um, I'm not sure, I, know, I don't know what's happening here in the state. I'm in Connecticut, I'm in the New Haven area, but there's, um, there, that this needs to be legislated, that there's still a way that, um, uh, and I, I was also, I almost became a hairdresser instead of a historian, by the way. So I was a cosmetology major in my uh, vocational high school and learned very early about how the curl of your hair uh, can determine its uh, need for moisture and all the things that if someone who has Afro textured hair or has to take care of Afro textured hair understands um, and that the dominant culture still doesn't get it. And it's like uh, 2021. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to just put that out there maybe to continue a conversation about bodies and, and futures and so much of what they were fighting about in some of the magazines I addressed still hasn't been addressed. Forget about people wearing um, locks in their hair. They were debating in the early 90s about the length, uh, the width of your braids. The smaller your braids are, the more they resemble individual hair strands and therefore more appropriate for work. Um, and so it's just, I, I appreciate us tying together more of these points about the body. Um, I'll jump in as a historian too. <laughs> Um, first of all, Siobhan, like, wow, your archive, I was just, is stunning. It's so amazing, just the amount of work and how much you've been able to sort of sift through and sort through. But I mean, when you were talking and also what everyone was saying is, is how much, when we're thinking about futurity and, um, when Thea was talking about, you know, you know, talking about speculation and using speculation and the speculative of thinking of futures. It's also about, um, I was thinking how much it is also about reconciliation, like reconciling a lot of history and things that are ongoing that have not been resolved. Um, you know, so, you know, Siobhan, when you're talking about the body and just like how much has not changed in terms of ideology and like the discourse and like treatment and um is is something that it's like in order to think of these futures it's also about the the possibilities are also about you know having to reconcile or reckon with these things that that don't change. So, you know, I'm like talking about martial law that happened like decades ago, except like not that much, I mean, there was a lot of hope, but like not that much changed, you know, <laughs> even after martial law ended and now the Philippines is under another authoritarian regime, which doesn't call itself an authoritarian regime. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, the way that all of us are talking about 
bodies and fashion and cloth and the intimacies with skin and the body and and all of that stuff is like a way to think about that relationship between past that have not been that have not been dealt with and that continue and also the possible futures. Mira, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, yeah, so I want to jump in here. I think it's uh, that uh, Genevieve, what you just said was a really interesting and 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 um, uh, uh, following the, the comment before that um, about what the cycles of what hasn't changed and how it's sort of you know, it repeats itself and how do we sort of break into that and, and I guess it's bit by bit make changes through um, cultural production. And I was thinking about um, a couple of things when you were just talking, I was, you know, I was, I was thinking back to the um, Triangle Factory fire that I think maybe was, I can't remember, 1904 around then. Um, and then the run of factory um, collapsed in 2018, maybe not 2018, 2008, perhaps, no, 2012. Um, anyways, there's sort of, you know, a hundred year gap, but it was an exact, almost an exact repetition of a large, um, you know, large number of casualty at a textile um, factory. And, you know, then I was thinking about your example of, with um, uh, Marcos and uh, Balmain and, and it reminded me exactly of what, um, sorry, not that example, but the example of the sort of the two modes of um, where fashion can, fashion can, can be, um, you know, reactionary or fashion can be um, uh, uh, revolutionary. And I was thinking about AOC's gown at the Met Gala and, and the, you know, that exact sort of debate about um, her gown being taxed the, taxed the rich, but then, you know, the Met Gala being this huge, huge, probably the biggest fashion event of, you know, um, of uh, North America or the world, even um, in terms of what, you know, in terms of sort of raising the profile of fashion. And I was just curious about your thoughts uh, specifically about that, actually, that um, parallel between the two. I'm sure you've thought about it um, because it was just so striking. And, you know, and what has changed or, you know, is there anything different in, in how you see um, what AOC did, you know, uh, last year or was it this year? I can't even remember now um, versus, you know, what happened in the example that you gave Yeah, I mean, the, that's a really good comparison um, because what I didn't really get to talk about with these um, beauty queens and like the fashion, the, the, the models, um, is that they were actually targeting elite and middle class um, Filipinos to try to galvanize them, to galvanize a, you know, a, a people of a certain class who might have seemed apathetic to the Marcos regime, uh, you know, and or like they, you know, they had not really been a part of it, uh, or not seen sort of like resistant towards it. So it is interesting, because um, most of the sort of social movements um, during martial law have been a lot of mobilization of, you know, working class folks and, um, and also like farmers and like, uh, in the rural uh, parts of the Philippines. So with the AOC case, so there are limitations to that, right? So to think about the like limitations in terms of like, who are you trying to galvanize, you know, to, you know, like, can you get on the side of revolution maybe? Um, and then with the AOC case, I think is very similar in that way where, I mean, her, the dress is very similar because the Met Gala in and itself had, ha does a lot of violence, right? Like the there's a long history of the Met in it itself. Like so we think about museum work. I mean, this is why Thea's work is also really important because it's like overturning or challenging the sort of violence that museums do, right? In terms of curation. So um so I think when thinking about AOC, there are a lot of critiques of what she was doing, but I also think um it's important to look at the why the her what she was doing was maybe always and already limited because of who she was trying to galvanize and like speak to if you think about like who was what who's going to be watching the Met Gala um and so I think it's like you know maybe we can like ask like is 
if we accept those limitations, is she doing something important or not? Or, you know, so I, I guess that's sort of what I'll say. I'm, I'm with you there on that, Genevieve, and thinking about these different spaces. So, you know, what if you're looking at an archive on the internet where people are self-fashioning and what impact does that have and where does it reach and what is the, you know, there's a, set, a broad sense of the dominant images for like hundreds of years around the Caribbean and how that's been marketed and the whole economy built around that. And so each time Dominican women are uploading images, it's in response or in conversation with that. And there's a, and they have a sense of that or the folks that I was talking with, which was typically working class and, call, and folks in college or college educated. So they had a critique of themselves in that. And so with your project, it's interesting to see the, you know, these two ends of a spectrum where you have like the elite engagement because there's something very different going on amongst the elite in the Dominican Republic and fashion. Um, but there's a sense, you know, a power and there's a, there was always this narrative of, well, if you wanna work at a bank, you have to look this way. And people had that in their mind as the aesthetic. And and so I guess uh, in each of your presentations, I mean, it's I, I'm just continuing to think about this access to power, maybe, you know, and how self-fashioning means access to power or um, or is can be an opportunity to mobilize that. And I certainly think, you know, from my ethnographic work, that's, you know, people have it, even if they're not like bringing a feminist analysis to this is about power, they know this will benefit me if I shape how I present myself in this way versus that way. Just wanted to add that. And um, Thea, the images, um, the, the art, I mean, one of them reminded me of the person in the, in the Toxic River, I think, um, reminded me of a Senegalese artist, Fabrice Montiero, who has this kind of like, you know, the, the mass production of plastic material and fashioning of self in response. They're really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, for pointing that out. I, you know, I didn't realize in uh, putting together this panel, I was like, oh, everyone's literally talking about fashion. I hope my examples were okay. And then I was like, oh, okay, good. At least the examples I brought everyone that was like moving and thinking through the body and also like taking on particular signifiers because then all of the work not everyone works with images of the body, um, but that Leroy new piece in particular, I find so fascinating because of the way that it traffics among realms. So I found it on Instagram when I exhibited the first time it was printed as like a fake Instagram grid on the wall, just to mimic and with some captions next to it, um, just to mimic how I experienced it for the first time. So most people are just literally scrolling through social media, they'll come across these strange images. And you know, Aliens of Manila was meant as a play on Humans of New York. Right, and so, which has its own kind of virality, especially around like images that are meant to like evoke sympathy and heartbreak and these like human stories. And I was like, what does it mean that he's turned them into these really weird creatures, aliens, and what are they observing, right? And they're not actually making commentary about anything. They literally are just like being fabulous, like kind of fashion models. <laughs> um, like they have no purpose, right? Like they don't, produce anything, they don't do anything, they're just there and they're beautiful. And so thinking about this more, especially in the context of your presentation to Genevieve about like what labor can like fashion do, I'm thinking like, what does it mean to refuse to produce in a society that right now, so many poor people are being remaindered, right? And left out literally with the trash where, you know, articles of cardboard and plastic are wrapped on their bodies when they're dumped and signs on their bodies are placed that say you're a drug pusher as like, the reason for why they're being discarded, right? So that's really something I'm thinking through. And I know that took the dark turn, but like, really, like, how do we actually talk about um, these different levels of violence? And also what does fashion and playfulness do to actually illuminate some of that? And I know there was a question from Mira too, and I'm so curious about these um, labels that you made. I know there was a Q&A in the chat about the labels and other pieces of your, of your practice. Right, I think we can move to the questions. And um, there is a question about the 40 symbols you created, Mira, and how do you see people using these open source symbols stamped on cloth, made into prints? Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, so the so the way I the way people have been using them and um, the way I, I hope people continue to use them is that these are actual cotton labels that I had print, uh, print, uh, manufactured. And um, so I've, I've used these a number of times to sew onto my garments. And then what, what I've done or what I've, uh, what, when, you, when you get the label in the mail, if any of you would like it, please contact me and I will mail it to you anywhere in the world. I've been sending hundreds of these around the world, but you get a card, which is an index card. And then you get a set of instructions on the back on how to use the label. And, um, and so, you know, I've been suggesting that people can either X out or circle the symbols that um, make sense in relation to the garment or the cloth that they're attaching the label to. So for example, you know, was, um, it's, it's really hard to show you this on a screen, but for example, this one here is a symbol for a hand-me-down, specifically called pass down. I, I, and, and so if the garment that you are sewing this onto is one that has been passed down over generations, then you can circle that, you know, and this is part of that emotional language of our, um, our care for the garments, you know, why do we care for the thing that we're wearing or the thing that we're using, but then, but then some of the other symbols are more about, um, you know, you may not, you probably are not going to know the answers to a lot of these symbols because there's so much um, non-transparency in the in garment manufacturing where we don't know where it's come from and who's made it and how much they've been paid and what kind of dye has been used and you know what kind of fiber has been used etc but but it's sort of a learning opportunity or an opportunity to think about um, these questions so you know no one's going to be able to entirely work with this but for example um, let's see here so you know um, uh, this symbol here with the spoon, you see that the spoon and the sewing machine, that's about a, a living wage. So um, is, that, is that the one? Yeah, that's the living wage symbol. So, you know, um, thinking about, do you know if the cloth that you're wearing um, has been manufactured with um, a living, uh, where, where the, the, the worker has been paid a living wage. So, you know, um, it's not in the public domain yet. I, I sort of need some time to look into that and how to get it there. But um, ideally, I would love for small uh, businesses and um, manufacturers of cloth um, to actually start incorporating some of these into labels. I think that would be really interesting. Um, I don't know, I might make a poster of it at some point because you do find posters of those like um, wash washing labels that people sort of put up in their laundry areas of their homes. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but one thing I know is that I would like, I, I, I made the label so that people can, through engagement with what they already have in their closet and through simple skill like sewing, like a needle and thread and sewing this on, can start to slow down their own um, relationship to cloth. And so it's not disposable anymore. And, and if it's not as disposable, you start thinking about also, you know, the non-disposability of the bodies who make people who make the cloth, right? Um, because they're actually very disposable, we've all been talking about today in the system that we we all function in. So yeah, that's, um, so that's a bit about the label, but I would love to send you guys these uh, labels and cards. So just feel free to get in touch. Oh, definitely. We will. I know I will. Um, and thanks for asking that question about the labels. Yeah. So there are a few more questions. Thank you, Shoban, for these wonderful questions. And um, there's a question for Rachel here. Where do you see the future of claiming Blackness amongst Dominicans and the Dominican diaspora, particularly with more attention to the Afro-Latinx experience? How does body politics play into this? Thanks for that question, Siobhan. Um, I, it certainly has changed in the decades since I was, you know, in the late 2000s, I was going to the Dominican Republic, then I was leaving there in 2010 into, you know, for many years. And so uh, there's a whole politics around hair, right? That is informing how people are read racially. And that has really shifted over the last decade. So, but then older generations will talk about 
the ebbs and flows of that. And what I what I mean is there was, you know, a real commitment and influence by the dictatorship 30 some years on how people perform their Dominican identity and um, align, um, alignment with European identity. And that meant straightening your hair. So there were not curls, but the younger generation right now, I feel already out without my finger on the pulse um, because natural hair has become very popular. There's a sense that that will, um, you know, pass. But what was striking to me were the moments in which people who I read as not necessarily Afro-Dominican were claiming blackness. And so I am more curious about when that happens. There are also uncomfortable moments where people were, you know, um, claiming blackness, and that is certainly because Dominicans are very mixed, and most everyone does have a black um, ancestor or family member. And so, po folks can also point to, you know, just a few generations back where you could see family photos and see that racial diversity. But there's no, you know, the history of racial construction is totally unique in that context and different from what we're taught in the US. So I would be curious, Siobhan, with your magazines, because you gave us a, you know, guided us through a lot of the textile and visual culture in a certain way. What are you seeing in terms of hair? Because is that, you know, the ebbs and flows in terms of natural style and how people construct identity through that? You know, I, I, I hate to say this, but I do feel like what you said that this might pass, right? because we can look at different times in the last 60 or 70 years where natural hair was popular. Um, and I think it's, it's hard, a hard thing to process when you think about something that is uh, organically part of who you are being a passing fad, that it will change. And straight hair is always okay, but Afro texture hair is only okay when it's cool and when it's popular. And so I think the hope is that this will continue and that this is not a phase and it's a it's a, a ongoing engagement although you know it's this new term i started hearing called texturism where a lot of what's happening with you know natural hair amongst um uh, black women or you know how we would define that more broadly is about sort of defining a curl and creating a particular kind of look that <laughs> you know strays away from uh, strays away from what is um I guess on the farthermost side of this this curl, it's a curl spectrum beginning with I think A, one A, one B, and it goes all the way to four C with the curliest hair being the tightest curls, and that there's always this desire to get closer to the lower numbers. And so I don't know, we we'll have to see, right? Some of this is just living through it and letting it play out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you point to this, you know, in like oh, so we all see in our work, it's like, okay, you can be other, but not too other, right? And when is otherness taken up? Um, and so in my project, what I ended up using were some tools and experimenting with, like thinking about surrealism and surrealist artists and the ways that they engaged with otherness as, you know, appropriative and exotification, but then uh, making an argument that there's like a, been a lot of influence in the Dominican Republic around surrealism. And you could say it sort of continues because surrealism is also engaging with the death and the violence that they was having a hard time, like letting go of because it's right there under the surface, no matter how fabulous, when bodies are performing, there's this danger, right, of violence. So I'm just um, checking to see if there are any open questions. Um, I, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, it's a comment more than a question, Mira, I really um, loved what you said about uh, mending and uh, the queer reading of mending that you did and how, um, you know, that create, that makes uh, the shawl um, injured and unique and just, you know, that, that reading of it, it also made me think of the care economy um, and, you know, whole, your whole attention to moving away from the object to caring um, for one another and, 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 and the actual bodies who are in production. And, and I'm also thinking of that in relation to your work, Thea, and again, going back to the resilience question and, you know, how, um, how you're using that. So I don't know if you know the two of you want to say a 
a little bit about that. I can just answer really quickly. Um, if I said resilience, I misspoke. I actually use the term survivance and that's borrowing from Gerald Weisenor, the Anishinaabe right? Yeah. Scholar and, and writer who thinks about, you know, more than, resi more than resilience, more than survival, how can survivance be a mode of trickery, of play, right? Of exceeding right, the limitations. And this is kind of funging up his quote a little bit, but hopefully you get the point. <laughs> um, and I'm interested in, in that, right? How do these artists, indigenous and artists who are not indigenous, but very much aligned and working in practice with indigenous artists, um, really imagining alternative futures, right? Where we're more than just merely survival, right? And thinking about more than, right, simply the basics. I mean, an artist that I'm beginning to write about is Martha Atienza, who's based in the Philippines and Bantayan Island. And she's made these, it's on my Twitter header, if you go to Twitter. Um, she has this beautiful film called Our Islands and it's a parade. It looks like a um, Filipino religious festival, Atia Tihan, or it's also sometimes a fashion festival. But they're underwater and they have on these um, old school divers masks and they're kind of performing these tableaus, some of them religious, others really commenting on um, Yolanda Typhoon Haiyan, which came through uh, the southern Philippine islands in 2014 and that region in specific, as well as, you know, the, the war on drugs um, and, you know, Duterte's current administration. And, you know, I think in the works like that, that I'm, I'm kind of writing about and, and curating and working with it all is pushing back in some ways against this notion that these communities are resilient and therefore you know able to be abandoned um, in many ways by the state after things like hurricane and climate emergency and um, yeah so uh, I just want to jump in there on that um, uh, uh, Thea in your in your presentation you showed an image of um, someone wearing a a suit, the aliens of Manila and someone wearing a suit made out of plastic and you said was in a river that was once a dead river but then had been revived specifically because of the work of activists and and, um, and indigenous and, and, and various people sort of locally. Um, and it, it really had me thinking about um, the, you know, the sort of the dark underside to fashion and the dark underside to clothing production in terms of dyes and pigments polluting and killing rivers, um, the very rivers of the, the, the people who are working in manufacturing the clothing that ends up on our bodies are, you know, those same rivers that at one point provided livelihood and, and um, you know, fishing and water and, and, um, and, and, and but as a result of the runoff from the factories and um, you know poor regulations and the sort of um, the, the capitalist system, those rivers end up dead. And it's oh, and it's the same people in those same communities, and then have to sort of with very little resources activate around reviving a river in order just to survive basic basic human survival. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but that image really made me think about that. Um, and it was it, it was quite a quite a quite an evocative, beautiful image of um, I mean it was gorgeous, but it was also plastic. It was also almost like it looked like you know stuff you just sort of collect from a dirty river, um, but transformed. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, no, that's literally it. It's tracing different for me. The, the book project in excess of the exhibition is about tracing the material histories of plastic pollution in particular, toxic dumping and um, agricultural runoff and other kinds of runoffs like what you're mentioning and thinking through both like the material uh, remainders that make these geographies so anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, anti-poor and violent alongside state violence. And then also thinking through how are communities in these places alongside artists who may or may not be from these places. How do we you know, take up these materials, right? And fashion another imaginary, right? Where the relations of capitalism and exploitation and extractivism aren't continued, right? Aren't underlining like all of these efforts. So absolutely. And that picture, I should say that photograph was taken, I believe in Anilao, which is um, 45 minutes south in Batanga. So it's not actually on the Pasig River. It's, um, it's open water um, that he's on, but you're exactly right. Like all of these places have been at this point um, mined, dumped, you know, all manner of things. The corals are getting bleached. 
their Philippines has some of the largest plastic pollution in the world. Like, yeah, everything you're saying is exactly what I'm trying to think through. Yeah, and, and just to just to add that, you know, we sometimes these things are happening within, um, you know, within North America too. Like within, Absolutely. you know, the fact that indigenous communities in Canada, um, number of indigenous communities in the North do not in 2021 as, as you know as we're talking about for example with uh in 2021 do not have clean ta clean drinking water coming through the tap mm -hmm. the drinking water is dark it's you know it's dirty it's 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 toxic um and so you know why why is there no clean drinking water in 2021 why are there you know why can you not wear natural black hair to an interview in 2021 like you know these things are very kind of connected um in terms of subjugation and um and so yeah i just wanted to I just wanted to add that it's right where I stand as well. You know, it's right where I work as well. It happens here too, um, but but it's the same global system. I wanted to add to that, just like the language of remainder, it is really helpful to me. But, um, you know, in the Dominican Republic, one thing that's familiar to me from Ghana is the whole industry around paquetes or like bundles of used clothing, right? And how much is built up around that industry. And in contrast to that of where people are shopping from the remainders of these more powerful nations, um, the what I it was took me a while to recall that around 2010 living there everyone was wearing Aeropostale t-shirts because they those were remainders too but I think that the factories were there and so it became the fashion right jeans and Aeropostale so it's like shaping in such an immediate way how people are and by everyone I mean yeah there's different gendered versions of that kind of branding but people represent you know the brand in that way so um you all had me thinking about that. We have a comment from um, audience member, uh, Brittany Wally. Uh, not a question, but this sounds very familiar, very similar to the Ashland Nyanza project, focusing on local river pollution in Massachusetts. I think to the earlier um, remarks from Thea, probably. Um, we are coming to uh, close to closing time. So if anyone has any final remarks or comments, um, please feel free to share. I know that I've learned so much and this has been just so amazingly beautiful and thought provoking uh, conversation tonight. Thank you all for um being here with us and if we can all join in thanking the panelists for your time and contributions today and uh, we hope that you will all come back and join us uh, in future events we have two lined up in the spring so thank you and good night <laughs>